I spend a very useful and informative spell with Dr. Van Samron at the Sagana Experimental Station up in the Kenya Highlands. He was undoubtedly one of the most experienced and successful biologists in Africa. He also had a remarkable, uh, remarkably close rapport with the surrounding wild bird life, a variety of which often appeared at our meal table, which was located in a secluded alcove covered with a flowering creeper. On one occasion, two beautiful hummingbirds fed within feet of us from nectar-filled test tubes. This was a remarkable example of man's ability to commune with really wild nature. Well, I visited all their principal fishing rivers with one of the department's officers, Norman Martindale, and assisted with some of their stocking program and hatchery work at the Cabarro Hatchery. I was also very pleased to visit some of the more interesting and remote game territory, very different from my own, and to see a giant forest hog for the first time. Before leaving Kenya, I was to have first-hand experience of an, uh, an ill-human Kabaru rhino, which is worthy of separate mention. I noted from the 1951 review of Kenya Fisheries that tourist trout fishing generated considerable revenue from the Kenya government, so I had a lot of worthwhile work to do when I returned to Achena Chena. Prior to embarking on the trip to Kenya, arrangements had been made for Gillian to meet me <coughs> at Nairobi and return to Nias there with me and for us to get married in Zomba the following day. Well, the arrangements went smoothly and we boarded a Civil African Airways internal connection from Nyasaland the same day, arriving at Blantyre with that precious cargo of uh, 10,000 Kenya trout eggs. We were met by the director after a two-hour flight and drove straight to the local electricity generating company where there were facilities for cold storage and for re-icing these eggs. That night uh, was spent with the director and his wife, having confirmed arrangements for the marriage by the district commissioner Zomba for the next morning. I was amused to be told by Gillian the next day that she had been discreetly vetted by the director's wife as she was getting dressed for the ceremony as to her education and social standing. Uh, this was in the good lady's bedroom. The trout eggs were duly collected the following morning and we proceeded to Zomba where we were du duly married and quickly on our way north with our precious consignment. It was a mad dash north with a further prearranged ice supply to Mzimba. And on our way again the following morning on arrival in Chena Chena, the eggs were carefully spread in a homemade hatching tray and all the remaining ice placed uh, in a gentle flow at the head of the tray to help with the temperature acclimatization. My an anxious examination the next morning revealed that all was well. They were watched over like a demented mother hen for the next 15 days or so when they finally hatched with their fat little orange yolk sacs and after a few months I finished up with 2,400 three-inch fingerlings, which had thrived on a diet of hard-boiled egg yolks, mashed duck and chicken livers, fed to them three times daily. These survivors became the nucleus for stocking the three selected local rivers, and were the original parentage of all trout stocking in the northern province. Those early days were exhilarating, exciting and anxious, and simply had to be successful as my reputation and no doubt my future rested on it. I could not expect the Nyasland nice government to fund another expensive expedition to Kenya. Eventually the local Africans became very interested in constructing and operating their own domestic fish ponds. It was very satisfying to be able to supply thousands of small tilapia free of charge to anyone who cared to collect them providing they could satisfy my African rangers that they had a safely constructed pond and preferably agreed to spend a day under instruction at my Chena Chena fish farming school. One of the most encouraging things about the Nyasaland Africa was his great enthusiasm for learning. They were a great pleasure to teach. Eventually all this field work could be competently carried out by my staff and I like to think that in this and some other respects, I finally left something really worthwhile on the ground. 
it was undoubtedly the enlightened support of District Commissioner Cosmo Haskard, who later became Sir Cosmo Haskard, Governor of the Falklands, and Sir Glyn Jones, Governor of Nyasaland, that these developments were a success, and I salute them for their foresight and encouragement. Gillian settled in well and took a great deal of interest in everything. This was no surprise to me as we had known one another for years and enjoyed fishing and working on the river together at home. Uh, she had several early introductions to the local wildlife. There were the bold pug marks of lion in the soft soil and on the drive just outside the bungalow two days after she arrived at Njenachena. Not long after this, the sharp clatter of leopard's claws along our 40-foot concrete veranda when it raced past just below our bedroom window and the final yelp of that unfortunate celium dog named Hornby who had been left in our care whilst his owner, Assistant District Commissioner Peter Hawker, was on leave. Hornby preferred to uh, sleep on the concrete, cool concrete veranda outside, a very reasonable preference. Regrettably, human memory being imperfect at times, both of us forgot to bring him in before retiring that fateful night. Very embarrassing for us. And our apologies to Peter Hawker. There were a number of other somewhat unusual wildlife incidents during those 13 years. I, I mentioned earlier the rather bad-tempered rhino in Kenya. Norman Martindale commented after this particular incident as it probably just had a sense of humour, but it didn't make me laugh. Uh, we were on our way up to the Kabaru hatchery in the early hours of the morning. It was damp and misty and we were making slow progress on a narrow red clay track. We suddenly came to an abrupt halt and were subjected, subjected to a uh, very violent up and down motion. Norman used an unrepeatable word that followed by, it's that bloody rhino again. We could not see much out of the dirty cab window, but on alighting, that monstrous muddy grey bulk behind the tailboard was all too obvious. Norman advised that its front horn was firmly fixed under the rear bumper. He removed his hat and started to beat the daylight out of his ears. Well, for a moment I thought the whole truck would somersault and we'd be crushed underneath it. Then there was a loud bang and a clang and one end of the bumper appeared above the tailboard. His Highness then turned and trotted off back down the track, breaking copious wind as he went. Anyway, we tied up the broken bumper with the tow rope and went on our way. As the years passed, we received occasional visits from VIPs, both local and from overseas. Some of these were sent up country and on completion of official duties, and were usually interested in game or fishery entertainment before returning whence they came. It was always a great pleasure to look after them. There were always, always much to see and to do, and their tremendous enthusiasm was always very rewarding. Our Governor General, Sir Glyn Jones, came up on several occasions on one particular visit. He wanted to inspect the progress of the trout stocking program and to visit the Nika Plateau. Well, on previous fishing and shooting visits, he really enjoyed roughing it and the campfire atmosphere. So I sent a few game guards ahead with tents and other essentials to prepare an accessible campsite on the grassland near the river bank. They were to move any undesirable game from the immediate area, and some of it could be rather inquisitive. The journey up through the tree line was always rather hazardous, but the advance party had done their stuff, and though we made frequent stops to observe game and bird life, we completed the journey in about two and a half hours, which was par for the course by the time I retired in 1964. As we came out onto the grassland, we were greeted by a flimsy pole and stick archway lying at a perilous angle over the track, displaying the word welcome. It was being held up at one end only by one of my game guards. And just as we passed underneath with nothing to spare, the whole contraption collapsed and fell in, in the middle of the track in an untidy pile of sticks. This really appealed to Sir Glynn's sense of humour. The campsite was well chosen and the tents properly erected with camp beds, canvas wash basins and a four gallon petrol tin full of clean water. 
In the centre of the small clearing, they had erected a huge bonfire all ready for ignition. Well, it would have done justice to Guy Fawkes and had to be partly dismantled for safety. The party included the governor's ADC, a police officer, and the usual shortwave communications equipment. And it was via this equipment that we received notification of the assassination of President Kennedy that afternoon. No time was wasted. A game water guard was dispatched to the headwaters some two miles distant with our lunch basket. Another detail to shadow us and act as a runner if necessary. <coughs> we assembled the fishing tackle, had coffee and a stirrup cup, and then fished our way upstream to the lunch basket, arriving about 2 p.m. The only game we saw on the way up was a small herd of roan antelope and a solitary Stanley's bustard, which walked slowly and sedately ahead of us for a good mile before breaking away from the river bank and disappearing over a ridge. The fishing was great fun in both directions. We saw a lot of small fish in the five to six inch range, which had to be natural reproduction. The original stockfish were like bars of silver, and all close to three pounds. They were easy to identify, as I removed their adipose fins. A very useful field check, which I had learned from Dr. Van Sumrum uh, when I was in Kenya. Well, after a good lunch, we fished our way back to the camp, keeping six of the 19 fish caught which provided us all with a delicious evening meal, complemented with a couple of bottles of Government House Chablis. This was followed by mellow reflections amid the bonfire sparks. We were on our way down by 8 a.m. the following morning after a good night's sleep, leaving the game guards to break camp and return to their normal duties. As we left the grassland, we passed under a new and much more substantial archway, which still said welcome, must have involved a great deal of voluntary effort. Sir Glynn requested the driver to stop in order to express his thanks for their enthusiasm. After taking leave of His Excellency, I returned to Enchena Chena, and he resumed his tour of other provincial developments. I was to see Sir Glynn a year later. On this occasion, I was to organise a wildfowl shoot for him and four VIP visitors. I had a very large lake and marsh in my area covering some 20 square miles. It was a very remote location requiring four-wheel drive transport during the wet season and pretty robust suspension when it was dry. Here again a tented camp was organised with mosquito net protection. I had a herd of over 200 hippo in the lake and the immediate area was well populated with buffalo and elephant had uh, that sort of humid, marshy aroma, which uh, a big game hunter can always recall. The party finally arrived and settled in rather too late for an evening shoot, which I replaced with a brief walk along the narrow, sun-baked uh, shoreline, uh, beyond which extended acres of closely cropped marsh and elephant grass, which provided the nighttime grazing for the resident hippo herd. The evening was alive with the grunting laughter of the hippo and the incessant chatter of guinea fowl come down for an evening drink. The darkened geese lifted noisily off the shoreline as we progressed and swirled back over us, causing some anticipatory comments. I suggested a return to camp as the mosquitoes were beginning to take considerable interest in our presence. Uh, the large communal mess tent had a welcome glow from the tilly lamps on the trestle table, and we all tucked into a good supper before retiring to our mosquito nets. The party was assembled in the mess tent for tea and biscuits just before dawn. Peter then led us in silent single file along the rather obscure track to the lakeside. After delivering us safely, he returned to camp to organise breakfast and would be back in a couple of hours to help pick up our bag of ducks and geese. It's pitch dark on our left with some reflected light from the late lake surface on our right. We were almost to our destination for placing the first gun when the boggy ground seemed to tremble under our feet, accompanied by a noise akin to an exaggerated start to the Grand National.